This message from Reverend Philip Epen is brought to you by The Lighthouse. Welcome. In this part of the series on how to study the Bible, we learn about the importance of using a good translation of the Holy Scriptures. Unless we can read the Bible in Hebrew and Greek, we'll have to settle for a good translation. And until we are confident about the quality of the translation that's before us, how can we begin our study? Dozens of English versions of the Bible are available today. Certain translations follow a word-for-word -word translation of the biblical text. There are a few versions that convey the message of the Bible in today's language and idiom. They follow a thought-for-thought -thought approach instead of a word-for-word -word approach. Consider this example. There are Christians in my country who hug and kiss each other after every church gathering, especially after observing the Holy Communion. They read a verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, which says, Greet one another with a holy kiss. That's a literal translation of the Greek text. Most English versions read, Greet each other in Christian love. Instead of a word-for-word -word translation, translators of these versions opted for a thought-for-thought -thought translation. It may not matter whether we actually kiss each other or shake one another's hands while greeting each other. But a modern translation that's silent about the holy kiss robs us of an opportunity to be exposed to a cultural practice of ancient West Asia. On the other hand, I might prefer a modern translation when it comes to certain passages like the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 2. It tells us how Jesus began the famous Sermon on the Mount. The Good News Bible says, and he began to teach them. But the English Standard Version is a more literal translation of the Greek. It says, and he opened his mouth and taught them. We don't usually say, and he opened his mouth and taught. That's indeed a word-for-word -word translation. Therefore, in such situations, we might prefer a thought-for-thought -thought translation to a word-for-word -word translation. Here's another example. The New American Standard Version of Proverbs, chapter 7, verses 11 and 12, goes like this. It's about a loose woman. She is boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She is now in the streets, now in the squares, and lurks at every corner. The New Living Translation conveys the same meaning using today's street language. Brazen and brash, she was restless and roaming, never at home. Walking the streets, loitering in the mall, hanging out at every corner in town. The more liberal New Living Translation conveys the message quite effective. If we arrange various versions of the Bible according to their philosophy of translation, we get a spectrum of versions as shown here. At one end of the spectrum, we find literal translations such as the King James Version and the New American Standard Version. At the other end, we find versions that are essentially paraphrases, such as the Living Bible. All the other versions can be placed anywhere between these extremes. We are told that versions that use dynamic equivalence or a thought-for-thought -thought translation are the most popular ones today. We should bear in mind that even these versions have their disadvantages. Therefore, while studying a passage, it is best to consult a number of versions instead of limiting ourselves to one version. 
This is especially useful when we deal with difficult passages. There are certain passages in the Bible that pose special challenges to translators. In such cases, if translators try to help us by choosing one possible translation over another, they end up imposing their views on readers. To avoid such a scenario, a word-for-word -word translation might be more helpful. Let's consider this example. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. The New International Version reads like this, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. According to the NIV, we are like mirrors that reflect the glory of God. At the same time, we are being transformed into God's likeness. The New Revised Standard Version puts it like this, And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord, as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. According to this version, we are not mirrors that reflect anything. Instead, we see the glory of the Lord as though it gets reflected from elsewhere. Now that leaves room for people to wonder, what's the thing that reflects the Lord's glory and makes it visible to us? The Revised Standard Version does not talk of any mirror or reflection. It says, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed into His likeness from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So then, what are we to conclude? Are we mirrors that reflect the Lord's glory, as described by versions such as the New International Version? the New Jerusalem Bible, or the New Living Translation, or even the Message? Or are we looking into a mirror to behold the reflected glory of the Lord as claimed by the New Revised Standard Version? Or should we just leave out all talk about a mirror and reflections like the Revised Standard Version did? When translators encounter a difficult verse, they make decisions for us. They choose what seems to be best in their view. They might leave alternate readings in the footnote, but then how many people care to read footnotes? Preachers or students of the Bible who stick to just one version are in danger of being carried away by the biases of one translator. The best way forward is to consult as many versions to arrive at a suitable conclusion. I found the literal translation of the New American Standard Version quite helpful in this case. It says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. This verse does not say, that we are mirrors that reflect God's glory. Neither are we observing the Lord's glory in a faint manner from another reflecting surface. Instead, it says that Christians are able to clearly see the Lord's glory as clearly as we see our faces in a mirror. This verse in 2 Corinthians is not the only difficult verse in the Bible. Consider the prophecy of Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 2. Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets, so that a herald may run with it. That's the New International Version telling us that the prophet had to write the vision clearly on a tablet, so that a runner could run with it. The English Standard Version puts it this way, and the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. Now, according to this version, 
the prophet had to make the vision plain and clear in the written form so that anyone who read it would run. Interesting. The New Heart English Bible has a different take on this. It says, The Lord answered me, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he who runs may read it. Did runners face any special challenge reading and comprehending prophetic writings? Why would the Lord ask the prophet to make it plain so that even runners might be able to read it? While translators of the literal versions struggled to make sense of this difficult Hebrew verse, versions such as the Holman Christian Standard Bible and the Good News Bible succeeded in capturing the essence of a plausible idiomatic expression. The Holman Bible reads, The Lord answered me, Write down this vision. Clearly inscribe it on tablets so one may easily read it. And the Good News Bible follows a similar line. The Lord gave me this answer. Write down clearly on tablets what I reveal to you, so that it can be read at a glance. A literal rendering cannot do justice to the message of this text. Indeed, a literal translation would be, that he may run who is reading it. In many languages, a similar expression is used to describe quick reading. Even in English, we talk about running through a text. Therefore, it is not impossible that Hebrew should have such an idiomatic expression. In such cases, a thought-for-thought -thought translation is necessary. God wanted the prophet to write his vision clearly so that someone could read through it quite easily. This is why we need to consult several English versions before we settle for a particular version of the text. At times, we may have to synthesize our own version after consulting these different versions. Scholars of Hebrew and Greek do consider other factors while choosing an acceptable translation. They are aware of differences between various available Hebrew or Greek manuscripts. Such considerations indeed influence the choice of an English version too. Discerning readers are aware of the kind of original manuscripts that were used by the translators of English Bibles. Christians who prefer the King James Version to any other version are devoted to a particular set of Hebrew and Greek manuscripts, even as they retain their preference for the KJV. In my opinion, they should read as many different versions as a part of their study. Thanks for watching. God bless you. Please click the thumbs up button if you like this teaching. Please consider subscribing to this channel. If you have a question, please feel free to ask in the comments section below. See you soon.